Hey everybody, Dr. Pingle here. Um, we are going to talk today about hotspot analysis, um, or as I like to call it, is my neighborhood weird? So the whole idea behind hotspot analysis is we want to sort of suppress what's going on at the very local level and look at the big picture and sort of see what are the big large scale regional patterns in our data. So rather than just sort of mapping a variable uh, and taking a look at it and describing it, what we want to do is statistically process our, our data and then present the results of that statistical analysis as sort of this aggregate um, regional analysis. Now, what a region is is going to depend very much on what your neighborhood size is, which is definable. So um, some of the tools that we're going to be talking about today try to make a guess as to what that should be uh, based on sort of the size of your features and the area that you're looking at. But you can always configure that yourself. Um, and so if you're not satisfied with the results that you're seeing, if you think that they're too big or too fine or too coarse, there's a knob that you can turn with, the, with all of these tools um, to grow or shrink that neighborhood depending on what you, um, what you want. The idea here is not that we're looking at where the high values are, but where the generally high values are, what regions tend to have higher values than the rest of the surface. Um, and you can imagine this as a kind of a smoothing technique, right? If there's a lot of variability in your data, you want to sort of suppress that sort of small scale variability in terms of, again, the, the bigger picture. So this is a view of income inequality um, ignore the fact that we haven't projected our data. That's okay. This is exploratory data analysis. Um, we've mapped our variable um, and we have our numbers that range. You can, you can look at the legend. Uh, our numbers range from about 2.7 to about 9. Uh, low values are kind of a, more of a yellow. Higher values are a red. What those numbers mean is they're the, the, the income of the 80th percentile of that county divided by the 20th percentile. So it's a ratio of sort of what do kind of higher wage earners make versus lower wage earners. Um, if everybody made the same amount of money, then that, then that number would be one, right? And of course, we wouldn't expect that. 80% probably will earn more than the 20%. So that number in practice is always going to be a little bit greater than one. Um, how high can it get? Well, that depends a lot on that depends a lot on the county, as you'll see. So, if you, as you're looking at this map, um, you can probably see some places um, in uh, in this area where that is true. Um, largely, uh, this tends to happen more in urban areas than rural areas. So, particularly in the Midwest, you can sort of see these isolated isolated little counties. Those tend to be places um, with larger cities. Um, but there's a bigger overall pattern. So uh, if I showed you this map um, and I just said, where are the hot spots? Forget what the, what the variable means. Where are the spots that, <clears throat> that seem uh, like they're more red than, than yellow? Uh, and if you do that, you can maybe spot some areas in here, uh, maybe a little bit of an area there, uh, maybe something over here, maybe something over here. Um, maybe this kind of extends out, right? Um, where you flag those is going to depend very much on the how you squint your eyes, right? It's, it's difficult to, to tease this stuff out. But, but generally, we might say, well, there's a pocket there, there's a couple pockets there. Maybe there's a pocket over here in San Francisco, a little hard to see. Maybe there's a pocket up here, kind of in the Northeast. <clears throat> the idea is um, that we can uh, run a statistical analysis to find those not only hot spots, but also cool spots, the lows. Um, so this is the result of an optimized hotspot analysis, which is a tool in ArcGIS Pro. Um, hotspot analysis is, uh, is a bit old. Um, the newer optimized tool set tries to do a better job of sort of guessing what some of the parameters were. Um, the spatial stats folks kind of figured that it was, uh, people were having a hard time figuring out what those, um, what those values should be. Uh, and so tried to make the tool make intelligent guesses about um, those kinds of things. Um, so what we saw before was an overlay. This is, um, this is the actual output and it looks something like this. Um, so you can see red um, as identified as being a hot spot, blue as cool spot. So indeed kind of the, the Southeast United States um, is kind of a bit of a hot spot along with a couple of really bright urban areas. Uh, the area kind of focused on New York uh, the area focused on San Francisco uh, and a couple of odd counties actually in South Dakota, uh, partially driven by uh, North and South Dakota, I should say, partially driven by um, uh, fracking. Um, so 
Uh, but there's also cool spots, right? So it's not only what the hot spots are, but what are the cool spots? Most of the major Midwest kind of focused on, centered on Iowa uh, is a cool spot extending kind of into Ohio and Michigan. And then there's this big section um, kind of out west, uh, you know, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, Wyoming area, um, some cool spots out there. So the idea here is that hotspot analysis is going to identify broad regional trends in your data, right? Given the map that you see above, you can sort of see highs, you can sort of see lows. It's a little bit tricky. Um, what you want to do is sort of um, uh, suppress a lot of that local variation and try to get the big picture. And that's exactly what hotspot analysis tries to do. Um, <clears throat> now, remember what I said, uh, the title of, the, of this lecture was, uh, is my neighborhood weird? Um, and I said, we want to define whether your neighborhood is different um, than the rest, not you, right? So what we don't want to do is just take a look at individual counties and say, is this county high? Is that county, county low? What we want to do is say, is the neighborhood centered on this feature statistically different than the overall data set? If I take my county, I define a neighborhood around that. Is that neighborhood different than all of the rest of what's going on? And you do this for as many features as you have in your data set. So there are 3,000 some counties. Um, we, uh, we do that on all of the counties. So this begs the question of what does it mean to be statistically statistically significantly different, right? Um, the Esri Spatial Stats folks will tell you that um, hotspot analysis differs from kernel density analysis in that we are using statistical methods to define what's different or what's a high or what's a low rather than just sort of um, applying some uh, ad hoc criteria. Um, so to do that, we have to understand kind of what, what it means for something to be statistically significantly different. And what we mean is, is the value that I am uh, and we'll use height as an example here, a lot greater or a lot less than what is typical. So this is a group of people. Um, you can see some people, you can see some people that are taller, you can see some people that are shorter. Uh, if we put Big Bird up here, Big Bird is a lot taller, right? Uh, from any definition, Big Bird is definitely tall and Elmo is definitely short. So how could we, uh, how could we indicate that? How can we, how can we use a statistical test um, to help us see that? Well, one thing that you can do is you can see how your height compares to the general population. Uh, so I'm about uh, a little over six feet tall. Uh, the average American male is uh, about 176 centimeters tall. Um, so I'm above average in height. Uh, how much above average am I? Uh, remarkably tall, kind of tall, weirdly tall, freakishly tall. These are sort of English words to get at sort of what would be, how tall would you have to be to be considered weirdly tall? Um, and again, what, how could we tie that into a sort of a statistical sense? Um, so uh, I, plugged, uh, I plugged my height into a uh, height calculator on the internet, uh, tall.life, uh, which is kind of a fun one. Uh, and it comes back and says, you are kind of tall, uh, 90.2 uh, percentile. So that means that I'm 90.2 percent taller um, than the uh, American male population, uh, put me in a room with 10 randomly selected people, I'm probably going to be the tallest. Um, 95th, tile, 95th percentile would be um, 1 out of 20, 99th percentile is 1 out of 100. So when you're looking at this hotspot analysis, if you look at the legend, um, you can actually see that you've got uh, hot spots and cold spots, but you're defining these in a couple of different ways, and that's why I went over that in the last slide. There's a 99th percent confidence interval, a 95% confidence interval, a 90th percent confidence interval. These don't exactly match to percentiles, but the, but the meaning is, is quite analogous. Um, and so um, you can see uh, that these differences, um, uh, essentially, you know, you've got, you've got these sort of dark spots and then you've got, um, it sort of tapers off slightly, not a lot, um, at the edges. So 95% confidence interval is kind of this like uh, uh, gray or blue, and then by the time you get to gray, that's, uh, that's the 90th percentile. So how can we, how can we standardize this approach? Um, so standardization is really important in any kind of analysis. It's, it's important in geographical analysis. Um, when you're doing things like comparing um, uh, 
uh, some kind of an event, um, you you often standardize, right? So it's not just um, how many things happened here, how many coronavirus cases were there in Montgomery County, but how many coronavirus um, cases are there per person or per, especially when the when the, those numbers are pretty small, per thousand people or per million people. Um, and in that way, we can sort of make comparisons between counties that are a little bit more realistic um, than just comparing raw counts, right? The fact that New York has a lot of cases means something, uh, but New York also has a lot of people. So we would expect more, more cases there, period. Uh, is it more than, than we would expect? Um, so in other words, uh, we can't just go, if we're, if we're trying to, to, to look up how weird something is and we want to get an, an estimate, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to go to tall.life to be able to look up your height, but what we ideally want to be able to look up everything, right? We don't want to go to weight.life or coronavirus.life uh, and figure out what the weirdness numbers uh, are. Um, so we have to have this uh, standard approach uh, to, do, to do this, to, to calculate what's, um, what's a high value and what's a low value. Height, weight, income inequality are all different. We need to standardize. Um, so what we do is we compare our average to the group average and then divide by the standard deviation. Um, the, of all of the, you know, when you take a statistics class, you get a lot of sort of um, ways of uh, taking apart data. Um, but this is one that just comes in handy all the time. Um, so this is called calculating a Z-score, also known as a standard score. You take your average, you compare that to the, the bigger group average, you subtract the group average, and then you divide by um, the standard deviation. So if I am uh, 185 and a half centimeters and the average American male is 176.1, I take 185.5 and subtract 176.1 and divide that by the standard deviation. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second, but um, a measure of variation. We divide that, uh, we, can, we can look that up just like we can look up the average height, the average or the standard deviation for height in uh, the United States uh, is 7.11. And what we get is uh, a number 1.32. That's my Z score for height, 1.32. Um, and you can feel free to, to, to look at these things. Um, like a lot of statistical um, data, uh, the, the Wikipedia page for uh, standard score is actually quite good. So uh, of all of those things, averages are usually pretty clear to people. Um, standard deviation can sometimes um, be a little bit fuzzy for people. How do we calculate the standard deviation? What is standard deviation, first of all? Standard deviation is a measure of variability, right? Um, uh, so at the, the bottom bullet point here, I say essentially this is a me measure of spread or variability uh, if the average height of the population is x uh, plus or minus y, right? So if you're using like a GPS unit, and say, ah, my GPS unit is accurate to within three meters. What does that three meters mean? Does it mean all your observations are gonna be within three meters? No, actually it doesn't. It means that um, some percentage of your observations are likely to be within three meters. Usually it's 95%. Um, so, so we have this measure of, of variability. Uh, confidence interval is kind of a measure of variability. Um, so standard deviation, how do we calculate that? We take all of our numbers. Um, we find out what the average is. Uh, so if this is our number set 2444-5579, first we figure out what the average is. So that's easy enough, the average is five. We add up all the numbers, we divide it by eight, we get five. But then we figure out how each of those numbers differs from the average. So two differs from five by three. We square that and we get nine. Four differs from five, by one, we square that and we get one, and so on, all the way down until we get to uh, nine. Nine differs from five by four, we square that and get 16. So we have all of these numbers that are the, the squared differences between each observation and the, and the mean value. We add all those up, we divide by how many numbers there were, and then we take the square root of that. Uh, if we don't take the square root of that, that's called the variance, uh, that's another measure of spread. Um, but a lot of times people like the standard deviation, partly because um, it gets our units back into kind of a, a normal form. Um, so if we square the differences at the back end, we take the square root of the value that we get. And that's sort of, we kind of ratchet things up and then we ratchet things back down into their normal level. Um, the Z-score is really just the standardized standard deviation. 
Um, so my height Z score uh, was 1.32. My percentile uh, was 90.2. Uh, and this is hidden under the video a little bit, but the idea here is that Z scores and percentiles track perfectly for a normal distribution. These are calculable. Uh, they're always the same, assuming this normal model. Um, so if you're one standard deviation uh, above the mean, then your um, percentile is 84.1. If you're two standard deviations above the mean, then your percentile is 97.7. Uh, if you're three standard deviations above the mean, then you're larger than 99.9% of the population. So z-scores and percentiles are directly convertible under this sort of assumption of normality. Um, and so that means that anytime you want to move between these two numbers, <clears throat> it's very easy to do that. Um, there are online calculators that you can use to do that. Uh, you don't have to guesstimate from the, um, from the image that you just saw. You just type in your z-score, and you get um, the percent of area below and the percent of area above. Uh, and you can define this as, as one-sided or two-sided, and so we'll kind of talk around that a little bit. Um, but you can sort of see how many, um, get my marker back out again here. Uh, if, if my z-score is 1.2, uh, then my percent area is about 90.65. The percent area above is just 100 minus that 9.3. So feel free, um, I would actually suggest pausing the video. Um, if you haven't paused already, calculate your height. Um, you can use the, uh, the mean and the standard deviation that I gave you. Those might be, um, uh, you might need to uh, Google um, the, uh, the average height for American women, for instance, um, to make sure you get that one right. Um, but uh, uh, definitely check this one out. This is measuringyou.com slash pcalcz. Um, easy to sort of do these uh, conversions. Um, within ArcGIS, you may have noticed that a lot of these things are calculated for you automatically. So if you um, just mapped, um, in this case, this is income inequality. Again, um, we've got our upper label, our lower label. Um, we get to see the histogram. This is all under the symbology tab. And then down below, you've got some statistics that have been calculated. 3,108 counties the minimum, the maximum, and then you've got the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean income inequality in the United States is 4.52. Again, that means the 80th percentile of earners uh, out earn the 20th percentile by a factor of 4.5. The standard deviation for that is 7, uh, sorry, 0.74. Um, so very easy to get means and standard deviations. Again, these are calculated for you automatically. So if you have that information, then you can calculate the z-score, right? You've got the mean income inequality, you've got the standard deviation, um, and that means that you can calculate um, the z-score for any county. All you have to do, uh, so here we've got a calculate field defined. All we're doing here is we're taking the value from each county, so income inequality. We're subtracting from that the overall mean, 4.52, and we're dividing that by the standard deviation, 0.74. We're calculating the z-score or the standard score for these counties, which is gonna um, tell us how far above or below the mean we are. Um, so this is uh, our county map, shaded according to the z-scores that correspond to the 90, uh, 99, 95th, and 90 uh, percentiles. Uh, so I'm kind of covering uh, this up here, uh, but you can look this up. So the, the 99th percentile corresponds to a z-score of 0.233. Um, the 95th percentile is 1.64, uh, and uh, below this, uh, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have it, um, but, that's a, but that's another number, right? So if we're looking at this, what this is telling us is which individual counties have an unusually high income inequality and which ones have an un unusually low income inequality based on this 90, 95, 99, right? Under this view, most of the United States fades out to sort of this background color, this mid value. It's between the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. Normal enough, right? Not, not freakishly weird. Um, but some counties are, are showing up very bright or very cold. Uh, they have an unusually low uh, disparity in incomes or they have an unusually high disparity uh, of incomes. Uh, and once in a while, you'll see a couple of these counties that are right next to each other, which is very strange, right? 
Um, so we've got counties kind of uh, in the American Southwest uh, that are, oh, I'll get my marker out here. We've got some counties in the American Southwest that are right next to each other. Uh, high income inequality right next to low income inequality. Um, we've got some cases like that actually around New York. Um, maybe it's not as weird as we thought to see these back to back. This is an area where they're mostly kind of all together. Um, this is an area where they're mostly all together minus this one here. Um, but uh, but so this this will, let's just focus on the um, extreme ends rather than the um, uh, rather than sort of the whole thing. Um, and I should note that there are ways to calculate percentiles empirically. Um, you can literally just count how many values are above me and how many values are below me and divide that by um, the total, right? So that would be um, a direct measurement of percentiles. Um, but we often um, can use normal, uh, we can use this sort of z-score percentile business um, if, uh, as long as our data is, is normally distributed. Um, I think we've, we've gone to great pains to point out that a lot of geographic data is not normally distributed. Um, so I think it pays to be a little bit um, careful about those decisions. Um, we could look at the distribution for income inequality. In fact, um, that histogram is on a previous slide uh, under the symbology tab. So you can always uh, take a look and see uh, how, um, uh, how normally distributed your data is before you take an approach like that. And that, that's always a good idea. Is my data, is my data normal? Just pull up a histogram uh, generated in ArcPro or generated as we've talked about in um, a notebook or with, sorry, a Jupyter notebook using, you know, statistics or matplotlib or something like that. Uh, but always look at that underlying distribution if you can. So this was a slide uh, that comes out of the um, Esri Spatial Stats um, uh, presentation. Um, this is uh, uh, this is a collection of numbers, right? And then we've got another smaller collection over here with higher values. Um, essentially, the idea behind uh, hotspot analysis is what we want to know is what are the chances uh, that these high numbers happened randomly? So. Anytime um, you're sort of drawing a sample out of a population, there's a chance that you're just going to draw um, a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, extreme values, right? Um, weird things can happen. If I if I'm flipping a coin, uh, what, what's the probability of getting five uh, five heads in a row? Well, it's two to the fifth. Um, that's a that's a high number, but it's not crazy, right? You've probably, if you've flipped coins at all in your life, uh, you've probably flipped five heads or tails in a row. Uh, that's not so strange. But flipping 20 in a row, well, that's that gets to be pretty weird. Um, so uh, what we can do is we can quantify that weirdness. We can say, what, how, how strange of, of an event is that? Um, and that's essentially what we're going to do here. Uh, what we want to know is, is this collection of numbers different than that other collection of numbers. Um, if we had all mixed these up in the same bag, what's the probability of us getting um, this high of a, not these particular numbers, but but a group of numbers essentially with, with that average uh, compared to all of the other numbers uh, that we could have gotten? Are these unusually high? Uh, in ordinary statistics, we'd use a, a tool called a t-test. Um, so a t-test just compares group means, standard deviations, and sizes to do what we did with the z-score. And it's really just an extension of the z-score idea. So all of these numbers here, if you're interested in, in following along, all of these numbers um, that you're seeing here graphically um, are pasted in the lower right. Uh, I'm sorry that the uh, video is covering those up, um, but, uh, but all of those numbers are there. And if you want to go back and run some of these tests on your own, um, you can either type these up yourself um, or you can copy and paste these from the slides that are posted rather than the, uh, rather than the video. Um, Excel can do uh, t-tests, um, so you can actually try this stuff on your own. So the key outputs of a t-test are two things. Uh, one is a t-statistic, uh, so this is just a number. Um, essentially, this is like a z-score. It's not exactly the same, um, but they are convertible. Um, but you can't just, you can't just uh, it's not the same thing. Um, the other thing that you're going to get most of the time People don't pay a lot of attention to the t-statistics. Um, one of the nice things about a t-statistic is it will have a direction. It'll tell you whether you're above or below um, the mean. Uh, are you a high value or are you a low value? Are you a hot spot or a cold spot? Um, 
The other piece of information that you get, so you get a t-statistic, the other thing that you get is a p-value. So the p-value is the thing that most people pay more attention to. Um, p-values are famously kind of misunderstood. Um, the p-value is essentially the probability of getting at least that strange of a result uh, by chance alone. So if you're just sort of put all those numbers in a bucket and you're just sort of pulling these out of the bucket, what's the probability that I would have got, um, not again, not those specific values, but that the difference, that the average difference between my, the, the balls that I pulled out and the other balls would be at least that much, uh, if not more. So what's the probability of getting at least this weird of a result by chance alone? If that number is low, right, if the probability is pretty low that I could have gotten that difference, then what we say is that's not a statistically significant difference, right? We think, ah, this isn't real. This could have just been random sampling. Error is not quite the right term, but this could have been attributable to just sampling issues. Um, uh, population, all of the numbers actually that we see in the United States for um, all of these different variables that we've looked at, um, essentially there's this randomness going on here. Uh, and part of what optimized hotspot analysis or just hotspot analysis is doing generally is trying to suppress that um, out to say, well, we've got a bit of a group mean here. This is above the mean, this is below the mean, but because it's not above a certain threshold, we think that that could have just been sort of a, a sampling thing. Um, that p-value is essentially, uh, you can interpret it like a percent. Um, so uh, it ranges between zero and one. If, if you get a p-value of 0.01, then there's a 1% chance of getting this result randomly. Um, oftentimes we would use uh, p-values of 0.05 or occasionally um, 0.1 um, to indicate we think that this is unlikely enough that we want to say that there's a real difference here and that and that what we're looking at is not just random uh, random uh, difference. Um, p-values don't have direction um, so you can use again that positive or negative value of the t-statistic to help you understand whether you're getting a high value or a low value. So a lot of the times when we're going to run this test, um, these kinds of statistical tests, we'll use software to do it. Um, so SPSS is probably the most commonly used um, statistical software, um, but t-tests are very easy to do with, with, within Python, um, and we'll show you how to do that in the applied part of the lecture. Um, uh, actually, we'll, we'll probably cover that in the future, um, but um, um, there are online calculators that can do this. You can actually do it in Excel as well. Essentially, what you're doing is you're taking two groups of numbers, and you're trying to compare those, right? Is the average of group B significantly higher than the average of group A? Where significantly higher means statistically significantly, and that's got this very particular meaning. Uh, could we have gotten this result by chance alone? So um, we, we can just paste those numbers into the online calculator. This is one uh, that I found, so the URL is here. Um, but if you just Google like online t-test calculator, there's dozens of these out there. So you paste them in for group A and you paste them in for group B and you hit calculate now. Uh, and the results of that are, um, are shown here. So uh, when comparing group A um, to group B, uh, actually we wanna make sure that we've got those in the right order here. Group B uh, is, the, is the high values here. Uh, this is B, this is A. Um, what do we get? Well, we get a, a difference. We get a t-statistic of um, uh, 6.91. So in this case, this means that A is, is lower, B is higher. Um, we get, um, we get um, a couple of other statistics that we're not going to talk about here, um, but we get a p-value. Um, so that p-value uh, is less than 0 0.0001. So there's less than one chance in 10,000 um, to get if all of these balls were in the same bin and you just randomly selected, what do we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We randomly selected nine balls out of this. Could we have gotten um, a, a mean difference of, of this? Uh, and that would be very difficult to do. You can see that not only are these values high, but they're actually quite a bit higher um, than the other ones, right? These are, these are, these are quite extreme. Is any, I don't even see any numbers that are sort of uh, close to this. Here's a, here's a 71, um, which is still lower than all of the values that we see here. Uh, here's a 62, here's a 75, uh, which again is still uh, lower than all the values we see here. So this, these are 
these are uncommonly super high and super different and that's super different and that's and that's why the p-value for this is essentially so so low uh, this is the actual output um, sometimes you're gonna have to pick some of these numbers out for yourself again most of the number the number that you're probably critically interested in here uh, is the is the p-value so um, before we get into what what hotspot analysis really is let's talk about kind of um, uh, a version of this like it's a t-test. Right? So if you've taken a statistics class, you've probably seen a t-test before. Um, and it's, so a t-test, um, you're just comparing these two groups of numbers. Statistical software can do it all the time. Let's try to extend our concept of, a, of an optimized, uh, or of a hotspot analysis um, just, um, just off of that t-test idea. So if we take Montgomery County um, as our um, central node, uh, and we figure out what the income inequality of Montgomery County is, that is 5.88, which again means the 80th percentile earner in uh, Montgomery, County, er, Montgomery County earns 5.88 times as much as the 20th percentile earner. So they make almost six times as much. Um, that has a z-score of 1.84. Um, so we're, we're close to two standard deviations above, uh, above the mean. Right, some some of these all counties are going to be above or below the mean. Right, everything is uh, well. I suppose you could be exactly at the mean, but that's pretty rare. Most of the time, you're above the mean or you're below the mean. Right, that part's not so weird. Right, but it's a question of how much. Is 5.88 <clears throat> a lot above the mean or a little above the mean? Um, so to do a t-test, um, we can so we could calculate a z-score. Right, we could look up the percentile, which you can go back and do. <clears throat> but what we want to do is define a neighborhood. So we're not saying, um, is my value different than everything else? What we're saying is, are the values around me different than all of those other values? So it's a subtle but important difference. And this is kind of what, this is why we're not just using a z-score. This is why we're using uh, this neighborhood concept. If we define our neighborhood as being all of the counties within a th uh, 100 kilometers, totally arbitrary. We're just pulling that number out of a hat. Um, I've, I've gone ahead and selected those here and you can see these on the map. This is what a buffer of, a, of 100 kilometers looks like. Is that the right size neighborhood? Should it be bigger? Should it be smaller? Eh, hard to say, right? Uh, and this is where um, the, the Esri um, description of this as sort of being non-arbitrary is a little bit um, unfair uh, because the size of that neighborhood is very much a selectable parameter. Uh, and so, uh, it is not the case that that this that, that hotspot analysis is like a purely objective thing. Um, you you still got sort of knobs that you can tweak, uh, and so um, I, I I I'm not on board with that characterization. But um, but anyway, so this is a, a hundred kilometer um, selection. Um, there are 55 counties within that hundred kilometer buffer. Um, the mean of those counties uh, within within here is 4.65. Um, and we had said that, you know, income inequality is not going to be one. The 80th percentile earner is always going to make more than the 20th percentile earner. So the fact that that number is above one is not strange. Is is what what is a number that is strange? So uh, the number for Montgomery County is 5.88. The number for all of the counties that are around me is 4.65. Um, if we invert our selection, right? So now we select everything outside of that 100 kilometer buffer, we get a mean of 4.52 and a standard deviation of 7.4. In other words, my neighborhood within 100 kilometers of Montgomery County um, has a mean of 4.6, which we'll round these off. All of the counties outside have a mean of 4.5. Is 4.6 that much bigger than 4.5? What we, what we can do is we can do this t-test. We can figure out um, whether that is a, we can calculate a p-value to sort of see how, how, how weird of a value uh, is that. Um, the whole data set, by the way, if we look at all of the counties, has a mean value of 4.52 and a standard deviation of 0.74, exactly the same, right? Now the reason, for, that's, that's, that's a rounding error, right? It's gonna have to be a, a little bit higher. Um, but to the to two decimal places, it's actually exactly the same. And the reason for that is um, there's not that much difference between 3,037 and 3,108, right? We've got a really big sample 
adding a couple more counties in there, particularly if the, if the mean is not that much bigger, is not going to make that much of a difference. Uh, it makes a little bit of a difference, but not, not enough to within this level of precision. Um, so uh, the way hotspot analysis actually works is, is it does it the way we've talked about before. It takes neighborhood A and it compares it to neighborhood B, right? What we're looking at here is all of the other ones. Um, but I would, I would argue that if you have a large enough sample, then probably using all of it uh, is going to be just as easy. And it saves the step of sort of having to calculate this out. Again, uh, all of these are calculated for all of the features. So we run this test for as many counties as we have. We define the neighborhood, we do the buffer, we figure it out, right? So we don't just do this for one county. We take this county uh, in Maine, we figure out its neighborhood, and then we run that statistic. We go to the second county, uh, we figure out its 100 kilometer neighborhood, um, we run the statistic. We go to the next county. We do that 3,108 times. Um, so uh, efficiency gains in processing actually make a big difference. And if you're in algorithms, um, you might start thinking about, well, okay, algorithmically, I can see that I'm saving a pretty big step here um, if I'm, uh, if I'm uh, not doing that. I'm saving essentially half of the work uh, every time I do this. So it's quite a bit faster to compare A to C than A to B. Uh, by almost a factor of two. Um, so you can actually plug these numbers again into, uh, um, so you, you can certainly run this t-test in Excel or you can run it, uh, you can run the actual test in ArcGIS. Um, you can use Jupyter Notebooks to do the test, um, but you can also use these online calculators. So you can take the mean and the standard deviation, you can plug those in. So here I plugged in the, the neighborhood around Montgomery County and elsewhere, uh, I plugged in the standard deviations and the n. Right, n is how many uh, how many entities are there in here? So how many counties were within 100 kilometers? 55. How many were there outside of that? 3,037. And we basically say, uh, give me an unpaired t-test uh, and then calculate for me. If you do that, um, you get a number here that says that the that the two-tailed p-value is 1.96. Um, so there's about a 2 in 10 chance of getting a value of at least as weird uh, as you see here, right? How much, uh, so my neighborhood around Montgomery County had a higher income inequality. It was m more unequal than, than the rest of the country. Was it unequal by a lot? No. Um, it, you know, you've got a 20% chance of getting at least that weird of a result if you just randomly picked uh, counties out. Um, so for most people that would fail the statistical test and that would be the end of it. Um, it's, it's not a hot spot. It's not weird. Uh, it's just random variation. Um, however, uh, the two tailed P test means that we're comparing sort of at both ends of our, uh, of our distribution. So when I say at least this weird, what I mean is at least this weird high and at least this weird low, if we're doing a two, two tailed P test. So, a, all right, two-tailed, um, if we're getting a two-tailed p-value. Um, if we are looking at only one tail, if we're very sure we want to compare just that directionality, then we can essentially cut that value in half. Um, so uh, if that's the case, then we're looking at a, um, a p-value of about a little less than 10%. That starts to get to be to the point where people say, well, it's, that might be statistically significant. Um, a a p-value of 0.1, in some circles, in some studies, is mildly significant. Um, is, is the income inequality for Montgomery County's neighborhood just a little bit higher? Maybe, right? Mildly significant. So <clears throat> I've sort of simplified things out a little bit here. Uh, and um, let's go back to what an optimized hotspot analysis is. So. The, op, the, the hotspot analysis is essentially relying on a statistical test developed for spatial phenomena called the Gettys or G. Um, it's calculated just a little bit differently. Um, and so um, essentially what we do is instead of counting all of the counties within my neighborhood, you actually exclude yourself. Um, so that's important. If Montgomery County as a whole, uh, if Montgomery County has the highest value kind of in a nearby area, which it kind of does, then if we exclude ourselves from that, 
um, comparison, then essentially we're going to be making it more probable that that could be um, due to chance. So we're running optimized hotspot analysis. We get our output out uh, and we take a look at Montgomery County. And what we get is a GI Z score, right? Z score. Now you kind of know what that means. This is essentially just a comparison of your yourself to everything else um, of 1.47. So kind of kind of high, right? Like a not crazy high, but a little high, right? About in the same. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. The p-value here is 0.14. Um, so there's essentially a 14% chance of getting at least this weird of a result. Um, the optimized neighborhood was also just a little bit bigger. Um, so because I was using the hotspot analysis tool, the optimized hotspot analysis tool. It chose the size of the neighborhood for me, so we didn't use exactly the 100 kilometer buffer. But you can sort of see how commensurate these two techniques are and how the one kind of builds off of the other. A t-test will compare the means, well, essentially the, the differences between two different groups, just a bunch of numbers, A and B. Um, the Gettys or G statistic essentially uses a spatial neighborhood to define it. Um, on the regular hotspot analysis tool, you can, you can turn those knobs a little bit more easily, but you can also get yourself into trouble. If you're in the optimized hotspot analysis, it's going to try to pick out the neighborhood size for you. But in both cases, we sort of get this like marginal eh, sort of, you can see that the coloring, right, because we don't exceed that 10% threshold, that 90th percentile, Montgomery County under the optimized hotspot analysis is showing up as not significant, right? We didn't quite meet that threshold of 90%. We hit, um, you know, essentially, uh, 85%, uh, 85.7%. Uh, and so we were close to being significant, but we were not ultimately significant. Um, the, the, the neighborhood centered on Montgomery County is not that weird um, in the scope of all of our data. Um, you can see though that one county away, uh, though that starts to change. And so there's a large hotspot that's kind of centered just directly west, and we're sort of on the uh, we're sort of on the edge of it. Um, interestingly enough. So to summarize this, um, Z scores are a way to standardize your data, and they're directly converted to percentiles. Um, so this is where we can basically compare an individual to everything else um, to see how weird it is. A T test is when we're going to compare two different groups together. Uh, group A and Group B. Is Group A different than Group B? So it's sort of an extension of the Z, it's sort of an extension of the idea of a Z-score, except in terms of instead of comparing individual to everybody, you're comparing group to group. Um, the important thing that you get out of a t-test is the p-value. So the p-value tells you uh, the, how likely it is that the differences that you're seeing could be just due to chance. The lower the p-value, the less likely it could be just due to chance. Um, that value never goes to zero. Um, if you ever see a p-value reported as zero, that's incorrect. Um, the correct way to sort of report a p-value is to say, well, it's less than 1% or it's less than uh, 0.001. Um, usually we don't print out 90 zeros um, and, and it's not that hard for them to exceed a value. Um, but beyond sort of 0.001, which is a 10th of a percent, we usually just say, it's less than a, it's less than point, p is less than 0.001. Um, so common thresholds for p-value, 1%, 5%, 10%, 0.01, 0.05, and 0.1, right? So keep in mind your, um, your, your percent conversions here. Um, those are kind of what you're likely to see in a hotspot analysis. The Gettys or G statistic that comes out of the um, hotspot analysis is essentially just a z-score um, and a p-value um, spatially configured and importantly, not including your own value, right? So that's, that's an important difference between uh, the Gettys or GI statistic. Um, we define a neighborhood, but we exclude ourselves from that neighborhood when we run the statistic. Um, so as a result, I would, not, I would not say that statistic necessarily sidestep the issue of subjectivity in maps. Um, or that, or the hotspot analysis is more objective, um, but uh, essentially it's a good tool in the toolkit. Um, <clears throat> optimized hotspot analysis, in particular, does a pretty good job of sort of 
showing you these big picture changes without a lot of um, configuration. I think it has uh, an unfortunate effect of maybe being too broad. Again, I don't, I don't know that taking away the control of all of these knobs is a really good idea. Um, the spatial stats folks are always trying to simplify these tools and make them easier to use. That creates its own sort of set of problems. Um, if you don't really know what these tools are doing, um, you probably are going to put a little bit more faith into the result than you than you probably should. Um, <clears throat> so to wrap things up, <coughs> let's show um, just these um, couple of versions of the maps again. Um, this was the map of income inequality. Uh, darker areas have more income inequality. Um, if this is this is sort of just mapping the raw data. Your eye can sort of find high spots. Your eye can sometimes kind of find low spots, although that's that's sometimes difficult. Your eye often wants to get drawn uh, to the darker features, so it, it kind of hides the low spots from you um, and and kind of makes you focus on the high spots, uh, which is which is different. Uh, in contrast, this is the output of the optimized hotspot analysis on the same data. Um, it is uh, it's it's quite coarse. Uh, these are you know these are really broad stroke generalizations, um, probably too broad, uh, but you know that has value too. Where are the high spots? San Francisco, uh, the American South, um, parts of the Lower Midwest apparently, uh, and New York. Where the, where are the low spots? much of the Midwest, right? Um, and then parts of sort of the Eastern seaboard and parts of kind of um, the Rocky Mountains. Um, so, but that's good too, sort of com comparing this to like trend analysis and spatial interpolation where the goal is not prediction, but the goal is to sort of seek out these sort of broad, broad patterns. If you're looking at hotspot analysis in that way, it's perfect for that, it's really good for that. Um, but also keep in mind that it's also quite, also quite coarse. You can't anymore start to make conclusions that really about individual counties. You're really just sort of looking at the regional effects. So you kind of can't really go back. Um, I'll post the data. Um, there was a part of this lecture, so you can play around with these tools on your own. Um, this is a really useful, um, a really useful tool. I encourage you to use it. Uh, thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.